Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jennifer Smith and uh, I am here today with Bruce Cronenberg from Abacus Entertainment. We've also got um, the other co-founder of Abacus Entertainment, Brian Falk, with us today and, uh, and he's the producer here. So my name is Jennifer Smith, I'm the Talent Services Manager here at Voices.com. I'm excited to be able to have Bruce and, uh, and Brian here to be able to share their experience and knowledge about demos. I mean, all of you, I'm sure, I either are interested in getting started in the business and recording a demo, or maybe you're looking to uh, to learn a little bit more about demos and and maybe get some new ones. So thank you so much, Bruce, for um, for being here with us oh, today. Thank you. <laughs> we'll definitely appreciate having you, sure. and I uh, look forward to learning from you. Yes. So um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Bruce Cronenberg, and I am one of the co-founders and also the voiceover instructor here at Abacus Entertainment in New York City. Um, I got started in the voiceover business about 25 years ago as talent, uh, working here in New York and also briefly in Los Angeles as well. Uh, booked many, you know, uh, big campaigns in commercial, promo. I've worked in um, video games and narration as well. A um, couple of years ago. Uh, along with my two partners, Brian Falk and Jason Chichi, we started Abigus Entertainment. Uh, Abigus Entertainment is devoted to not only producing great demos, but teaching folks who are first starting out in the voiceover business, wanting to learn about the voiceover business, how to do the reads, uh, how to plug into the business, how to get really good at this since it is a skill. and. Also, in addition to that, here at Abigus Entertainment, we do media production. We produce corporate videos, and we hire our students to do voiceover for the corporate videos as well. Uh, we're a young company. We've been around uh, starting uh, in September. We've been here for two years, and um, we're very excited to be here today to talk about how we do demos and why you need a producer for your voiceover demo. Um, so, to start with, um, I want to talk a little bit about the demo itself. Um, you know, you need a demo, uh, f first of all, to get taken seriously in the voiceover industry. Uh, it's probably the most important marketing tool for getting you attention and work in the industry. And you know, you want that demo to, sh to showcase you at your best so that the buyers, the agents, the casting directors, will take you seriously as a competitive VO artist, you know, who can deliver the goods. If your demo is top-notch, more than likely you will book work directly from that demo without even having to audition, which is great. Uh, that's the best you can hope for. Your demo becomes a tool that works for you and represents you as a complete voiceover pro. So, the important thing to know, though, is that this kind of demo, you cannot produce this by yourself. You can't do it alone, right? or with a friend, or you and a friend. Most of us might know someone with a recording studio, you know, of some kind, maybe a friend of a friend who records music or podcasts, and they may have excellent equipment, you know, microphones, recording software, the whole bit, and those are certainly important aspects of a recording, but that's not enough. You need someone who can conceive, create, and direct. Your demo should not be cobbled together for a small price by someone who isn't knowledgeable about the voiceover market and what the buyers and agents are looking for, which is why you need a producer for your demo. Um, Bryant. Brian Falk is my partner here at uh, Abigus Entertainment. He produces all the demos. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that, you know, and about why a producer is important for a demo. Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is Bryant. Brian Falk, how are you? Uh, the whole thing here we're trying to focus on a little bit is uh, creating a great demo, which is a little more involved than just a terrific microphone, a terrific preamp, I have a new computer. It's really about how it gets produced. And that's where I'm coming in. I'm, I'm basically the main producer here at Abacus Entertainment. I've worked in the advertising field for oof, over 20 years. Um, I work for agencies such as Gotham Advertising, PhD, Omnicom Media Group. And I've been very involved in their creative departments, especially, and uh, really had to focus on getting copy where it needs to be. Now, the uh, kind of the best part, I'd say, about our demos 
is when we make them, we're making them to sell you. And whoever makes a demo for you better keep that the focus. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't about the products. Yes, of course, there'll be product names in there and you're gonna talk about chewing gum or cars or whatever, mm -hmm. but it still has to be shaped to fit you the best. Mm -hmm. Meaning, what are you able to do and what's really marketable out there? Mm -hmm. Because those two items have to come together, lock in to make a way more successful, mm -hmm. successful demo. Um, one of, the, uh, one of the things we run into with that is some people are good with what we call more of an old school style sound. All this week, save 25%, blah, 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 blah. Very big and loud, uh, almost kind of a legacy style versus what's really more contemporary now, which is the real person style read, which is it's very interesting. They really want to book you, talent. They want to book that talent, that person. Uh, it shows up a lot more than just the voice you do. So that's just a little bit. There's so much more to it <laughs> than that, and it would take the rest of the day uh, for me to keep going. But I'm going to hand it back to Bruce now, and he's going to keep filling you in on some more of the details here. Great. So um, basically, you know, a producer makes all the difference in how the demo sounds and is perceived in the market, like Brian was saying. So, you know, what I wanted to do is I wanted to sort of use an example of someone that were or, or rather, uh, a bunch of guys that we're all really familiar with, uh, and that's the Beatles and their producer, George Martin. So you're probably wondering, why am I talking about the Beatles in relationship to voiceover? This is more about how a demo is produced and how production and a producer's point of view and perspective can give you a brand, okay? So when the Beatles first came to George Martin to record their early songs, they were pretty raw, okay? They mostly played in like these small noisy clubs that they were used to performing everything loud and fast in. And George Martin helped them figure out which songs were best to use, how to capture their sound for the studio, arrange the songs to their commercial potential, and they ultimately gave the Beatles their brand. So what we're saying is wouldn't you want a producer to help give you your brand as a voiceover talent? You know, with voiceover demos being submitted and posted in huge numbers on a daily basis, how do you stand out? If your demo just consists of you reading some copy that you pilfered from magazines with some lame music behind you, trust me, you won't stand out. There are too many demos like that out there and the powers that be, honestly, you're sick of hearing them. How is a well-produced demo different from that? A well-produced demo should be custom built especially for you. So today I'm gonna to take you a little bit through what in my experience is a successful demo session from start to finish. If all these elements are packed into that one minute demo, it will be the marketing tool that gets you your attention, the attention that you know, you're looking for. Now, first of all, if you decide to hire someone to produce your demo, you wanna make sure either they own or have access to a full working recording studio, like the one we're in right now. It would be even better if your producer was also your engineer and had full knowledge of how to record with Pro Tools. Now your session should start off with you reading copy for your producer. This can be copy that you've worked on yourself or that the producer provides for you. Keep in mind, this is not the copy that will go on your demo. As your producer listens to you read the copy, they should start to get an idea of what your particular sound and approach is. They should then begin writing your copy for you as they listen to your reads. And that copy that your producer writes for you should be short and concise so that at least six spots can be created for your demo. They don't need to sound like full commercials, okay? Um, they can just sound like grabs, you know, or snippets from a full commercial. Also, each spot should showcase a different side to you. For example, one spot should be upbeat and friendly. Another could be authoritative and businesslike, sarcastic and cynical, flat and detached. The demo should capture different attitudes and opinions but it should sound all like the same person. You don't want to change your voice on each spot for a commercial demo, just your opinion and your attitude. Now, your producer should also be able to direct you towards your best reads. After the copy is written and you are in the recording booth doing those reads, your producer should be capturing everything that you're doing and guiding you to the reads that will eventually be used on the demo. A producer should have editing and mixing skills as well, 
or you know, at least be able to tell an engineer what they want if they can engineer and mix the demo session themselves. That's why you want someone who can do it all, right? You want someone that ensures that your demo will be fully and completely produced from beginning to end by putting it in the hands of someone who is adept at writing, directing, recording, mixing, and finalizing. Brian, you want to say a little something about that? Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, the whole, um, the whole demo business, because we really are a bit unique here because uh, Bruce has terrific relationships with agents and producers uh, at a level far beyond anyone else I've ever ever been involved with and uh, it really is to our advantage because when we make a demo um, you have to realize it it really has one main purpose mm -hmm. it's its biggest job and if it does this I think it's done its job is to get your phone call that's what it's supposed to do it can't get you the booking you have to do that you have to win it after they get you that call um, one of the unique things that's happened which Bruce mentioned and it's because of the internet which is pretty interesting, is people are booking directly off the demos. And this is happening because clients have complete autonomy to view any of the demos they want whenever they want. And I'm there firsthand watching some of my other producers and clients literally going through the demos. And they hit one and they go, wow, that's perfect. He, if he can do that sound he did on that TJ Maxx spot, if he can do that style on our product, I'm done. I don't even, I don't need to audition, that would be perfect. That's what I hear over and over again. And it's because they can sit with them, go through them, and pick. It's probably a little sad for the casting people because they're losing out on a casting. Um, but for the talent, it's really terrific. I mean, I literally have firsthand experience of one of my clients who's booked well over 30 spots just off his demo. Mm -hmm. And he can't believe after we uh, put it together and um, right upstairs from us. And it's been, it's been a great experience. So that's, to me, a bonus, a terrific right. bonus. But the truth is you want the phone call, you want the interaction. Because once you get that interaction, you are 100 steps ahead of everyone else who hasn't even communicated with a client or with talent you know, or, or with an agent, excuse me. That's great. You know, like I said before, the producer should have editing skills, mixing, mixing skills, hopefully. If not, they're working with someone who does. But the most important thing is the final, the final, the final session where everything's done in post-production. Um, a good producer, first of all, once you finish the recordings, um, they should be able to take those raw recordings that you've done and turn them into real sounding spots or snippets from spots. And you should be a part of this, okay, when we do the post-production. For instance, you know, a lot of people, when they produce demos, um, they say, okay, thanks a lot, come back next week and pick it up, right? We don't do that. Um, you are in on the post-production when we produce one of your demos. So that's when you come out of the booth and relax and watch Brian do his magic. Um, for instance, you know, if you're working with a producer, they should be up on music and trends. Um, you don't want some out of date 80s music on your demo, uh, unless it's being used as a parody, you know, or it's tongue in cheek. Uh, the right choice of music and sound will enhance your demo and your read tremendously, right? Then the order of your demo comes in. Okay, that's amazingly really so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that you know, Bruce just touched on it, but it's like literally, we once we get things organized and together, the amount of time we spend on the order, y you wouldn't even believe it. And mm -hmm. it's funny when uh, we put um, when we first do the recordings, people think we start doing the order in the order we record you, mm -hmm. and it's no, no, we have to produce each spot, right. and it's interesting how they chain link together correctly. You really have to look at a demo as one item. Uh, people tend to look at it as each individual, but you have to group it together and it has to help each other. Now, what's been happening, again, internet has shown up and made some changes, which is, I used to do it, finish, we do the order, which is, you really have to do it. But now because of the internet and websites, which of course you almost have a website of some sort 
as a VO talent. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not mentioning something completely unheard of at this point. <laughs> no. uh, I tell people Google is now the new yellow pages mm -hmm. for looking up talent. Uh, first hand experience, client sitting right next to me. I need something dark and smoky. I need, and I remember the name of the talent and I type it into Google and I go, I hope he has a web page. I hope he has a web page. <gasps> there he is, Steve, blah, blah, blah. Oh, terrific. Here's his demo. And I click play and he books the job. It's, it's really gotten to that level. But uh, getting back to the website and the demo, uh, there's been the next phase, which is kind of coming. It's, it's not here yet, but it's arriving, is we do the demo, we do the order, which becomes the master. Then I literally ship each piece of the demo separately. So this is new now. This has been happening in the last year, where I then make another subfolder of each item, each six spots or seven spots, that they can put up separately on the website to promote different things. This is what's starting to happen now. It's going to be the norm in another six months. It's gonna be like, yeah. how could you not have this? Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but order is still important. Um, don't forget too, uh, depending on your target, if you are aware of your target, you will be adjusting your demo to fit your target. For example, I have a lot of clients, if they're gonna send a demo to pharmaceuticals, we, of course, will move the Tylenol spot to the number one slot. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So we will make adjustments in the demo if we're at the advantage of knowing who our target is. It's really a plus, okay? And we've had agents who have been doing it for years, and it's so funny, they asked me for permission to change the order. I'm like, of course change the order. You're selling the, the talent. So that's happening too. So that's, that's a real advantage if you know who it's going to. Totally. Yeah, no, I mean, the order of your demo is so important. You know, you want to lead off with that best spot, and you'll know what it is. We know, we already know what it is because we produced it. But you'll hear it as soon as we say, this should go first, right? This should go first. Uh, and, you know, also, um, when you lead off with the spot that you've really nailed, you know, if you're sending it to agents, you want them to keep listening. There's the 10-second rule. You all know about the 10-second rule. 10 seconds and they're not interested anymore, 10 seconds and they keep listening. Right, that's the 10 second rule. So you want them to keep listening. So you kick off with the best spot and we are certainly gonna help you pick that out. Um, that was another thing that George Martin did for the Beatles. An upbeat song was followed by a ballad, then a mid-tempo song after that, that may be something a little edgier. The more varied it is, the more interesting and engaging it's gonna be to listen to. So after this final mix, a producer will give you a copy of your demo to take with you when you leave the session. You should not have to come back in two weeks and say, they'll say to you, well, yeah, we'll, we'll have it for you in two weeks. No, you walk out of Abacus Entertainment with a demo in your hand. If they skimp on the production end, it doesn't matter if your reads are good. It needs top-notch production to match it, okay? So a badly produced demo is a voice way up front, okay, with a little bit of music underneath it, <clears throat> and that's it. That's not what you want. You want that voice, that read that you've done so well, mixed in with great sound effects, great music, editing, all of it. All of it matters. The whole sound of the demo, not just the individual pieces, the whole sound, the whole feel of the demo is what matters. All right? Uh, Brian, you want to add something to that? It's, it's interesting as, as we're moving through this with the demos, uh, we, we did focus on commercial demos, yes. which is terrific. Uh, I do want to bring up that, of course, there are other demos. You've got promos, narration, uh, corporate, um, audiobook, one of my favorites, video game and animation, mm -hmm. which is a blast. Uh, we, we do focus on commercial a lot because we found... That's what agents want to hear first. Yeah, I've, I've sent out a terrific animation demo to an agent, many agents, and they'll reach back and go, this guy's amazing. Where's his commercial demo? And it's because if you can do all that on an animation demo, of course you should have a commercial demo. Now, why? Well, because they can't book you without that commercial demo. They need to show their clients your ability to do that style of work. So it's interesting. You may love a certain thing, um, but you will probably always need a commercial demo in your back pocket uh, to, to move forward. Uh, one of the kind of unique things I've seen with some of my clients and Bruce's work with them too, is we started with the commercial. They made it through, you know, a lot of opinions, a lot of turns, a, a lot of decisions in, in what you have to do. They find it a, a little overwhelming. 
and they shift towards more of a corporate narration style and they feel way more comfortable. There's a lot less choices you have to make. Uh, it's a bit more focused on diction when you're doing the narration in the corporate style mm -hmm. material. Um, and they feel way more comfortable and actually grow in that field. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I had put maybe one narration corporate style piece on the commercial and seeing where they go, we come back and rebuild something fully for the corporate side. Uh, what's fun about corporate too is it really can be a, a business grown on your end as talent, whereas uh, agents are handling commercial, national spots, even local work. You as a talent can literally uh, look for that corporate material on your own. Uh, I'd say one of the funnest stories is we have a client who's reached um, kind of maximum density of corporate work because the beauty of corporate work is it tends to repeat. It tends to come back month after month, same client. So she reached a point where she had enough clients she didn't need to look for any more. Uh, she couldn't fit them in. So that was kind of fun. I always like to hear that kind of success yeah, yeah, yeah. on top of it, you know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, um, the thing about our demos is that people either sign with agents from our demos or immediately book work off of them because what we aim for on all of our demos, be they commercial, promo, animation and video games, narration, what we aim for is that these sound like you should be doing these spots. Because you know, it's all about the reads, right? Yeah. That's, it's an interpretive skill voiceover. It's not really about your voice yeah. so much as it is about your ability to interpret copy. And the copy that we write for you is catered for you. It's customized for you. So if you can't interpret copy that was written specifically for you, you probably shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> so. Yeah. And we talk about, uh, we always, I always kind of make the analogy that uh, making a demo or a piece on the demo is like putting tinsel on a Christmas tree. If I have a terrific tree, all the trimmings look even better. That's right. And the tree is your reed. And if I have a really bad read, no matter what sound effects I put on, that's the trimmings, the music, everyone's going to go, wow, production's excellent, but talent's not uh, up, to, up to snuff. Mm -hmm. So that read is what uh, Bruce and I actually spend the most time on, which everyone should be doing if you're going to do this, uh, meaning those reads have to really be as if you booked the job. Uh, and we always warn our talent when they go in the booth for a demo that we're going to do this like you booked it, not like you're just going to go, hey, right. I'm doing a read, how's that? Uh-uh. You're going to do the whole commercial five, six, seven times, then we're going to go back, hit each line, each phrase three or four times. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to say, wow, you know, I don't really like what we said here. Let's try and say something different to work even better. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? It's, it's that, you know, and it, and it brings up the strength, I believe, our demos is our ability to throw things away. Yes. We are total, I run, you know, I've written the copy and I'm the first person to say, that's not working. It's really hard to do. It's, it's really important. Even the talent doesn't want to not do it. Mm -hmm. They feel bad. I'm just like, it's not you. We're just not doing what that's we needed right. to do. Yeah. So it's so key to have that as the focus when you're building, you know, no matter where you are, all the trimmings can be done after, you know, all the trimmings can be worked on. I mean, I've spent times on just working on a cricket sound and you know what? That's fine. I can dig up 30, 40 different crickets and we'll get one. Don't worry. We'll get it to work. But if the reed's not right, we've got no tree to work from. Exactly. You know, like Brian said, this is like a booking. Okay, this is not like a, a, a voiceover coaching session. Brian and I turn into a couple of producers, okay, at our, at our voiceover demo sessions. And we start saying, no, 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 read it this way. You know, we're not going to get intricate about how we work with you in terms of the way we'd work with you if it was a coaching session. You know, we're producers and our job is to produce a great product, which is your demo. Might be a good time for questions. What do you think, Jennifer? Well, thank you so very, very, very much. Uh, thank you. Yes, let's uh, go ahead and jump into questions right away. And um, so the first question we have here from Jim is, what's your process for working with someone who has very little voiceover training? So that probably is Bruce's question. Yeah, You're the, okay. the coach. Either way, I, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, what's the bit who has very little training? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to come in and either meet with me in person or meet with me through Skype if you're in another state, another country. 
uh, I'll give you some copy and I'll work with you on the copy and see what your interpretive skills are like because that's the first and foremost thing. Uh, like I said earlier, it's not so much about your voice. There's a lot of people in the industry that I know, for, known for years. And if you met them, you wouldn't think that they have this great voice for voiceover. Their voices might just be very neutral sounding, but they have an ability to interpret copy and a great ability to take direction. So that's what I'm going to work with you on first and foremost is um, whether or not you have the ability, okay, to just look at a piece of copy and figure out what to do with it. And if you don't know what to do with it, I'm there to help you figure it out. I'm there to help you learn how to interpret copy. So that's the first step that I take with any new student that comes my way via, they walk into our office or I work with them on Skype. Thank you very much for that. So I have another question here from Amada. I'm a new talent in Calgary, Canada, and finding it hard to get a producer, any pointers. So I think what, um, what we need to know is, you know, how does somebody work with you when they're not here in New York City? Okay, yes, I've done, I've done many demos. We have a huge group of people in Colorado that I've done a lot of demos with. And we, um, what we do is a number of different ways. Uh, we have a lot of experienced booking talent that have studios in their um, actual homes. And they're very familiar with Skype and something called Source Connect. And we actually do a direct transfer of their audio reads to my computer. And I actually record them directly. And then I take all that material and build out the production. On another level is we phone patch in and that means that we're on the phone listening to you. You're recording your material into your computer, either at a studio or at home. Then when we're done, you simply send us your audio files. Uh, when we do that, it all comes in, and then we actually edit all the material together to make those final pieces, and then I do the production work. Um, we've done a lot of successful demos, actually, like this recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Had a lot of great agent feedback. Uh, I'm working with David Lyerly, who is also another instructor here on promos, and uh, terrific feedback. And all his clients are Colorado, out Denver, town. out of town. Yeah. Uh, so we've gotten pretty good at actually mm -hmm. listening through, uh, whether it's Skype or phone, to hear what we need mm -hmm. and make it happen. Also realize, too, if, if I still don't have what I need, I'm going to call you back and we're going to record more. Uh, it's not a one-shot deal. It has to be a great, a great piece. If it doesn't do its job, then uh, we kind of haven't done our job. That's how exactly. I kind of look at it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Well, this kind of goes on the same uh, vein of questioning here. Mm -hmm. Christina says, how do you pick the right producer? And then Christopher says, how do I find a studio? I'm very new and I uh, live in Washington near Olympia. And obviously, Bruce and Bryant here are going to be very biased and say, well, come call us. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. However, I, maybe we can kind of give the, the crowd a bit of an idea of what they need to look for in the right producer. Um, how do they know when they're going to be able to work well with them, and what kinds of things should they um, they look out look out for? Well, I mean, like I said earlier, um, basically, if your producer has the ability to write copy, record, direct, mix, do all of those things, then that person could probably help you make a good demo. Um, so that's what you want to do. You, want, you might want to interview that producer and say, well, you know, for instance, when you produce a voiceover demo, what's your process? You want to know what their process is. You know, everyone's got a different one. Um, we believe ours is the best only because your, the demos are customized to meet your particular kinds of reads, your particular kind of approach, and your personality. So you want your producer to, like, be aware of who you are and what your abilities are so they can cater the demo to your needs. In other words, it's customized for you. Yeah. You know? I would say too, uh, if you're really trying to get details of, of somebody handling the production for you, mm -hmm. if they're involved in the ad business, it's, it's a stronger placement in terms of a producer because you are looking to make a commercial demo. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hey, what projects have you worked on recently? Do you know what I mean? Uh, what, what, you know, pieces have you developed? Could I take a listen? Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, all my stuff is available online. Their stuff should be there. Uh, nothing should be hidden. It should all be there. Uh, there must be music and there must be sound effects work on your stuff. There's no escaping that. So make sure when you hear stuff, you want to kind of make sure that the, the ear is on that. Um, just like a heads up, my, I, I come from originally music. That's the music background. Mm -hmm. So when I'm cutting music to somebody's commercial, I'm editing the music. Uh, it's really important that people listen to the music track and make choice decisions that will push your opinions in your spots. Mm -hmm. Meaning, oh, a cymbal crash happens right when I get frustrated. That's awesome. Those are the kind of decisions, too, a producer needs to be making for you. Uh, it really, it, it's amazing how it elevates. I mean, this morning I spent over an hour just on two pieces on the music and moving the music around and doing edits within the piece mm -hmm. to get certain cymbal hits to hit at the right time and things mm -hmm. like that to happen. Just slapping the music under, it works one out of maybe 300 times maybe. Right. So it usually doesn't happen. You right. usually have to edit your music and that's just another sign of a good right. producer. Absolutely. Okay, great. And um, sorry, Amada just uh, followed up with another question saying, can you clarify how does actually how do you actually book work if you're an out-of-towner? So, you know, if you um, need to be able to use the studio. So what I would say is that you should really consider um, having your own home studio. Mm -hmm. uh, that would definitely be a good option for you, especially if you're going to use a site like Voices.com to audition for jobs. It doesn't necessarily make sense for you to audition um, for a job at a studio and pay for studio time uh, if you're not going to book the job. Um, however, when it comes to booking the job, um, if you're able to uh, to afford to go into a studio, that's always an option for you. Um, but that's what I would say about actually booking the work. So let's go um, here to Paul's question. Mm -hmm. Paul says, how much time needs to be allocated to, um, to, to work on a demo? Three hours. <laughs> usually three. It usually takes about three hours. The first hour uh, we're creating the copy for you. Uh, we're also listening to you read other copy as well, and then subsequently creating your copy for you. And once we have about four spots, then we put you in the booth, and we start directing you doing the four spots that we've read for you. Um, while you're in that booth, we're gonna create two more spots, and we're gonna feed them to you while you're in the booth, giving you a number of six spots on your demo. And that's gonna take about another hour or so. Then the third hour is the post-production. You don't have to do anything during the post-production except listen and say yes, no, I like that, and just say, awesome, that sounds great. Um, Brian will then you know, add music, sound effects. Uh, the three of us will figure out the running order, what spot should go first. All this takes relatively about three hours. Right, if, they're here, if they do a walk-in. If you do a walk-in, right? <laughs> if we do it by phone, well, Brian, you explain yeah. that. What happens so, when we do it by phone? Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. I've been talking with David, too, you know, the other teacher coach, here, yeah. um, because, you know, it, it's really quite an experience to come in and do the demo mm -hmm. with us. And uh, we're, we're actually trying to come up with a, a package where people come to New York, have a terrific time, do their demo with us exactly. here. Uh, and you can, I guess, write the whole trip off because it's really part of your business, yeah. building your voiceover demo. And then, you know, you get to be in with us directly. Right. So that's really my favorite way to build it, which right. takes about three hours. Sometimes it's four hours. Sometimes right. it's a little shorter. It's whatever it takes to get it done right. Uh, and, and otherwise, if we're doing it through the phone, we'll probably spend at least two hours on the phone. Uh, when we do phone records for demos, I have to have a lot more safety because I don't know exactly if it's what I want until it gets into the room with me. So we have to kind of over record. Usually I do one or two extra spots, so I'll do seven, maybe eight spots. So I have to do a lot of that to cover the bases. Mm -hmm. Then I do the production, and then we send you the MP3 as the first listen round, mm -hmm. see if changes need to be made, etc. Cool. So next question here is from Gary. Uh, Gary says, do you also do multilingual demos? Um, I have done VOs in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And since I'm self-produced with my own studio, how do you work with that? Uh, we do a lot of uh, multilingual stuff. Uh, when we're doing it for a first-time demo, 
What I like to do, remember I always want people to get uh, a phone call. So what I'll do is literally put, for example, Spanish, I'll put one, maybe two Spanish speaking pieces mm -hmm. inside the uh, English demo. Because if you can do regular English terrific and then flip right into Spanish, it immediately tends to get a phone call. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, people, oh, I should do an all Spanish. Yeah, you will do an all Spanish one after you get the phone call. Right. See, they go, wait, was that you speaking Spanish? And you're fluent. I'm glad you called. Yes, I actually am completely fluent in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then they say, terrific, can you send me a Spanish demo? And then you call me back and say, we gotta put a few more spots together. They want a full Spanish demo. That's what you wanna do because that generated the interest. Mm -hmm. It lets you build that, you get the interface with the call, and now you'll build a full Spanish one. Okay. Um, so we've done that, I've done Spanish, I've done French, I've done, uh, I've done Greek, actually. I did two mm -hmm. Greek demos, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I will tell people, though, if you're interested in doing multi, you know, lingual Spanish, you really must be fluent. You really. I mean, I talk about the same, you have to be at the same level as a musician session player, meaning they come in, I hand them sheet music, they look at it, and they play it. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you? I write something down in English, you translate to Spanish, and you say it. Mm -hmm. That's how it needs to be. Why? Because when I book Spanish speaking or, or foreign language, so many times the script is wrong and it needs to be corrected and they really lean on the talent to take a look at it and do that. Another problem is they write the script in another language and they use what we call the Queen Spanish or the King's French and uh, talent comes in and says, you know, nobody says it like this. This right. is kind of very official. And we say, okay, well, how would they do it? Conversate, oh, well, they do it like this. And then you actually have to rewrite the way you're going to say it. You have to initial it. And then we have to submit that back to them so they have it as reference. So it really is important. If you're going to do multilingual, really make sure you're good. Here in New York, you know, Spanish speaking demo is a different kind of Spanish. Yeah. You know? It's interesting. I do have um, agencies that I'll call mm -hmm. for actual location. For example, Quebec French right. is different than French in France, the accent. Right. And certain jobs require very specific accents within the language. Mm -hmm. So if you're at that level, you should know what you are. That's a big Absolutely. thing. Uh, if that helps. <laughs> yeah. No, that's perfect advice. Okay, so we have another question here from Jose. He says, Ec excellent advice. Uh, when seeking a producer to work with in developing a solid demo, would you recommend calling up a radio station, TV station, and possibly pursuing available talent there? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, pursuing talent at, from, at a radio... Well, that might not be the best place to go not for producing a voiceover demo. Um, now, if you're looking to send your demo to these people, that's a good idea. You know, if you got yourself a good demo and you want to pursue producers on radio and TV so that they can listen to your demo and think of you for work, great. But as far as like finding someone from the world of radio or TV to produce your demo, uh, I would say no. Now we have a question from Zion. Uh, what does a character copy read look like? Okay, characters are usually uh, real people uh, in real situations. For instance, the difference between radio and TV. Radio is first person. Uh, you have no visuals, so you're a person. You're like a guy that works at a gas station talking about Castro motor oil, you know? You're a mom looking on the shelf at Clorox Handy Wipes, but you're a real person. Now, if you want to take that a little further, a character demo can also feature you doing different voices to be considered for animation video games as well. Liquid Drano, you're the voice of a drain, you're the voice of a lawnmower, you know, those type of things. You know, the, again, that's when you've got to like call upon those voices inside of you that you only bring out at like parties or the bathroom mirror, exactly. You know, you want to like bring out those funny voices that are in there that you don't always bring out in public. That's what they want to hear on animation and video games. We've also got a question from Angelo. He says, what are the most effective elements to include in an animation and character demo? So when we talk about that, when you say elements, I'm going to assume you're talking about character choices. Mm -hmm. um, there are kind of different levels. I think the most important thing I'd want to stress at the moment is there are voices that you will do, and then there are people who can do impersonations. Mm -hmm. And for example, oh, I can sound just like Billy Crystal. 
that's a different demo. <laughs> so if you can, if you do what we call soundalikes, and there are people, we have, I've had people say, oh, don't talk to me, I'm working on my Obama, I can't talk until I get it. Right. Uh, that's an actual different demo than an animation slash video game demo. Uh, one of the key things you have to have on a video game slash animation demo these days, because it is totally valid, is you, as a person, are a character. Because video games have gotten so advanced and look so great, you, as, uh, you are an actual character now that should be in your demo. Mm -hmm. At least one. See, and it's, it's kind of bizarre, meaning, oh, like me talking right now, the way I talk? Yeah, yeah, okay, I will put a massive exploding gun in my hand that's on uh, some foreign planet. So that's one. Uh, the other thing about animation demo video game, the biggest thing is can you make your characters sound completely different from each other? It's so key. All my pros that I've talked to, um, Paul Liberti upstairs, who does tons of animation work, it's the first thing when he sits with me and we listen to demo, he's like, oh no, that sounds like the same person. Oh, that sounds, as it has to be as different as possible. Mm -hmm. When I teach introduction to video games, the first kind of final exam is you have to give me two voices that sound completely different. Like I would never believe it came out of the same person. And they're talking to each other. And they're talking, yes, I usually have them do a partner read with each other. So. It's so key now, as a hardcore person doing this, you need seven to 12 of those. If you can get me seven to 12 on your demo with a partner read in there, right? Um, another thing too with all my students, I say, if you're a man, you have to do at least one old woman. <laughs> and if you're a woman, you have to do at least one boy. It's a key thing you have to have in your arsenal. Uh, it's almost like the pros expect it. You know, so I hope, hope that helps. <laughs> Definitely. And so then the second half of that question was also um, singing is one of my VO strengths. How do I best incorporate that skill into my demo? So the singing is kind of fun. I, I came from singing myself too. Uh, what I find funny, uh, there's a technique when you're doing commercial work that I find very few people tend to go to uh, that I have to instruct them in. And it's, I call it the sing song which is if you, if you win the lottery, for example, instead of saying, I win, you go, I'm a winner. That little silly thing is not on very many demos. A lot of people don't go to that technique, to that sing-song technique. Um, if we're dealing with a, uh, for example, a commercial demo and you want to integrate your singing, one of the things I've done is actually, for example, Kit Kat, give me a break, give me a break. I actually will, I did it on one. I had them use that kick that bar, bar. right. Yeah. I'll have them do that in a very low, comfortable, almost like they're in the kitchen and they're just opening the wrapper. And then you will then do the voiceover on top of your own little song. Mm. So you're singing, give me a break. And, and then as the VO talent, Kit Kat, because everyone needs a break. See, so you're actually doing both parts. Mm. What does that do? Why do I like it? Because it generates a phone call. Did you sing? You're singing on that too? Wait, you're doing the whole thing on that? <sighs> yes, I am. I actually, actually do that. Actually, you should tell, well, we should tell you that the, the, the spot that we created, which Brian is talking about, was for a gal who's in Mamma Mia on Broadway. <laughs> she came in to do her voiceover demo, and we're like, you sing. You're a singer. You're singing ABBA songs every night. So we created this spot. She's singing the Kit Kat jingle, and, and over it, she's doing a voiceover. Yeah. So that's the way we were able to feature the fact that she could sing because in some places they still need jingles. They yeah. still use them. Yeah. Um, so I think... Yeah, yeah it's, it's basically that. I mean, you're, you're not going to sell that you're a singer on your commercial demo. That's right. It's actually a, a jingle demo if you're doing that that's separate. Right. If you're doing character animation, I might actually make a character that has a sing-song quality. Right. So I would actually, if you're really good at that, generate some kind of maybe space alien that has that Right. that in their kind of style of talk right. where they sing song. Uh, you know, I'd say a big thing about our, our stuff too is when I'm working with Bruce and we're, we're always trying to laugh. We're, we always want to have fun because mm -hmm. agents, people, they want to laugh. They, they don't take it too seriously. Yeah. And that takes some thought sometimes to come up with something. And uh, I know I'm always trying to make layers that people can listen to a demo and go, Oh, well, that was a great demo. But if you listen closely, right, she stayed trying to find a date. And in the background, we've got give me a higher love 
as the song. And it's like, oh, if you stop, but it's in a busy restaurant, so it's not really loud. It's just back there. But if you right. listen, we've got Higher Love showing up, which is kind of what we did in this last project. So it's building those layers, too, because I've had agents call me and be like, oh, did you actually, that's a Dave Matthews song you have. In the, and it's like, well, they just called, didn't they? See? Because he went to that next level and loves that Dave Matthews or whatever it is, and it generates that interest. So. That's right. I've got another question here from Tim. I uh, love the details. Any practice material that you may suggest for practice? Well, I've got a suggestion for you. If you go on Voices.com, go to our resources section, you'll see a script section mm -hmm. um, that's got all kinds of uh, um, royalty-free scripts that you may use. However, um, if you're looking for some, some stuff purely just for practice, you can also uh, use your Voices.com account. So if you have a Voices.com account, whether it's even the, the guest account or one of the paid memberships, go into your account, go to the jobs section, and you're gonna see all of the jobs that match up to your profile. And whether you've got the uh, premium membership or not, you can see the scripts that the clients are posting and you may use those for practice. And what the best part about that is, is that those are real scripts, those are real jobs, it's relevant material. Uh, do you guys have any suggestions for, um, for practice material? Uh, I have different, different styles of practicing. You know, the first thing I tell everyone, if you want to be in this business, you have to be able to read. Uh, if you want to be in the Olympic ski team, you have to be able to ski. So what does that mean? Uh, I have some people I have a tough time getting through copy. So I say, go home, grab a Wall Street Journal, grab a New York Times, something wordy, mm -hmm. and speak out loud without all the crazy opinions, just nice and clean as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. Do it for two minutes, three minutes a day, mm -hmm. and you will read 10 times better by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. That's one thing you can practice for just mechanical and technique. Also, yes, and also, um, just in terms of like the fact that, uh, as you know, you know, most voiceover reads have to sound conversational. They have to sound real. They have to sound like you're actually talking to someone. So like Brian suggested, taking copy from a magazine or a newspaper or even from a book, right? And you record that and listen back to it. If it sounds like you've taken that kind of written copy and made it sound real and conversational, you've actually found a way to say it rather than read it, that's a good clue that you might be right for voiceovers because it's all about saying it, not reading it. So if you could take stuff that's readable and make it conversational and like you're, like you're uh, communicating an opinion to another person, that's a great way to practice too. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. And so we've got a question here from Glenn. Glenn says, how often should you update your demos? Okay, that's the classic question yes, we get. Uh, <laughs> you know, my busy guys that are really working constantly uh, we usually do some kind of change roughly every six to nine months. Uh, it doesn't always have to be dramatic, but they always want to have some adjustments. Uh, my heavy guys who are crazy earners want to always be up on it. Usually, it's about two years maybe, right? About two years yeah. worth is yeah. worth two to three is that. what I'm seeing yeah. for people doing on commercial yeah. uh, stuff who are still at the beginning stages too and moving forward. Um, I'd say one of the biggest indicators on a demo, because, hey, even I can't tell who's going to be in business in two or three years, but if there's a Virgin Mega Store on your commercial demo, it has to come off, because yes. there's no more Virgin Mega Store. Or Tower Records. The Tower <laughs> Records. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's, a, that's usually your first big indicator, is yeah. you go, wait a second, three or four of these businesses don't exist, right. and they're on there. Some people will say, oh, but it still shows what I can do. No, it doesn't work. The agents are kind of up on it. And there's like, there's no Tower Records. Why? This must be old. See? So you have to update when that happens for sure, I'd say. Uh, the other thing that can happen is we're going to, you know, you build your commercial demo. It goes out. And you start booking a lot of one kind of style, a little bit more of one style. So in the next year, you want to maybe angle your demo to fit that style more. Right. So if there's two or three spots that you never get called on, certain certain kind of style, maybe it's very loud or very upbeat, and you're like, no, I always get the cool, smile, smirky guy. Okay, well, let's take off that really upbeat one, add another smirky style in there because that's what you're booking a lot of. So that would be a, another indicator of uh, time to make a change. 
Raul has a question. Why is it that music and or sound effects are so important to a demo? Does that detract or distract um, from the voiceover and cover up a weak voice? Well, on, on the production side, uh, the reason music and sound effects are so important is we're really trying to make the demo sound like book spots. Mm -hmm. We're asking, uh, you know, we're hoping that people listen are saying, when did you do these campaigns? Mm -hmm not if you did them. Uh, that's kind of the level, that's one of the reasons, because commercials and stuff are not without music. Mm -hmm. Now the other reason is, yeah, people would like to hear your voice with music and see that it's working. The other plus is music tends to push the opinion and the persona more if you do it right. So for example, if you uh, are doing a new, um, a new uh, banana boat beach tanning cream, and I put a nice surfer sound under you, surfer music, if the both come together right, it's going to really sound even bigger mm -hmm. than you just doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big, uh, a big part of that mm -hmm. to make sure that happens. Absolutely. Now, just a big caveat for people, when you audition, do not put music on your auditions. Mm -hmm. And here's the reason. I'm sitting in the room with the producer, we're listening to your auditions. I have the writer there. Oh, the music director is there who's going to be writing the music for the commercial. And you put music on your audition. You've insulted several people in the room because the music director is like, wait, I'm writing the music. Why would he put music? So it's a real detriment to put music on the audition. Don't do it. People have plans for music. Uh, for example, you hear a lot of popular songs in commercials. They pay a lot of money for those songs. So you putting your song is like, no, no, we've already contracted the song. What is he doing? See, it, it just adds confusion in the room. It's so funny how it happens because when you do it, no one seems to be able to leave the fact that you put music on your audition. Right. So don't do it. It's a real caveat. I know it, it'll make you sound better when you hear it, but when you think about, wow, in the room, there's the producer, the music director, right? Everyone who's involved in the commercials, they're listening. You've now confused the issue. So that's my warning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just to clarify that. The reason you want good sound effects and good music and good production on your demo is because we're putting you in the context of a real spot. Okay? When you're auditioning, okay, you don't have to concern yourself with that. You don't have to concern yourself with sounding like you're in a real spot. What you're doing at an audition is you're giving them you. So you want that just to be a raw recording of you doing your interpretation of that particular spot. When you're doing a demo, when you're recorded, when you're recording in the booth and we're making your demo, we're putting you in the context of something that's finished so that you sound like you're ready to go on that campaign immediately. So, nice. yeah, that's the idea. I definitely agree with you, Brian. Um, you know, people think, oh, well, maybe the person will hire me to do the music too and I'll get more money. But the reality is, is that a lot of times the voiceover is one of the last things that's getting done. Everything else has been done. So yeah, it's definitely, it can be a big distraction. So I hope that you've all learned uh, a great deal today. I know I found it very, very interesting and really want to thank both um, you, Brian and Bruce for all of your time. So thank you so much everybody for your time today and uh, we'll look forward to working with you all again soon. Bye-bye.